Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you so very much for being part of today's forum. Before I begin um, my keynote address, there are some very special people who I would like to say thank you to. Uh, my family is here, and my nephews have made a special effort to be decently dressed in uh, suits and ties instead of their usual t-shirts and jeans. So thank you. And I have some friends who have come, uh, both old and new friends. I would like to acknowledge that Datin Halima Said was the first person who actually introduced me or made me aware that I could speak in public. Um, that was in 2002 and I haven't stopped. <laughs> so if anybody wants to blame the person for letting me do this, it's her. <laughs> I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Rose Alinda from UTM. I don't know where you are. Is she here? Oh, hi. She, she uh, from the gang of four who were at um, the Oxford Alumni Weekend last year. Um, Dr. Rose, Dr. Masputria from UTM and Dr. Rosie uh, were there with me and we had great fun because we weren't students and we didn't have to cram for exams. I would also like to thank Dr. Gana Kumaran. I can't see him. Oh, hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, he's in charge of the PowerPoint presentation. And um, I've chosen him because he, he, he said that he's got, he's very skilled in clicking the computer. And um, I also thought that you would appreciate having a, go, uh, a PowerPoint presentation in case you got bored of just seeing me and listening to my voice, at least you have something there. Colorful, bright, pretty, vibrant. And when you're bored of looking at me, look there. So many thanks, Dr. Ghana. When we talk about building bridges, let me just add that Dr. Ghana and I are both Malaysians. But whereas I'm a Muslim, he is a Hindu. And he is now here helping me at an Islamic forum. So that speaks a lot about building bridges, whether locally or internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, there is truly a great need now, more than ever, to build bridges of understanding between Muslims, whether they live in the East or the West, and the predominantly Christian countries of North America, Canada, Western Europe, and Australasia. Muslims have become part of constant news items and articles, but not always portrayed in a positive light. Thousands of books have been written and have been published arguing either for or against this religion. On the 27th of October, His Royal Highness, Prince Charles, Prince of Wales, gave a lecture at the Sheldonian Theatre, University of Oxford, entitled Islam and the West. Part of what he said includes the following. If there is much misunderstanding in the West about the nature of Islam, there is also much ignorance about the debt that our own culture and civilization owe to the Islamic world. The medieval Islamic world from Central Asia to the shores of the Atlantic was a world where scholars and men of learning flourished. But because we have tended to see Islam as the enemy of the West, as an alien culture, society, and system of belief, we have tended to ignore 
or erase its great relevance to our own history. If in 1993, Islam had already been seen as the enemy of the West, then imagine how Islam was perceived after the events of 11 September 2001. Events that are etched into the minds of everyone around the world, regardless of what race or religion they may be. In the wake of what happened in New York City, at the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania, many hundreds of thousands of writers, journalists, political analysts, social commentators, academicians have tried to analyze that day's events. One writer, Akbar Ahmad, wrote that in the course of doing research for his latest book, um, during which he toured around the Muslim world, he said that each and every discussion led directly or indirectly to events that took place far away in America. The United States and the Muslim world had become irreversibly connected in an adversarial relationship and henceforth, every action taken by one side would elicit a reaction from the other. September 11 changed and challenged both worlds in unexpected ways. The reason I believe strongly in building bridges of mutual understanding between Muslims and the non-Muslim people of the West is because most people do not know that the impact of 9-11 which had on us as Muslims. Some people will presume that we do not care about the deaths of innocent people so far away, but this is not true. It is not as if we remain unaffected or were unsympathetic. I would like to share with you my own experiences the days before and after 9-11. My family had come down to Johor Bahru, where I live, because it was during the school holidays. And it was one of the few times when all of us could be together. So it was a sort of family reunion. On the 10th of September, I had gone to the hotel where my family stayed to have dinner with them. And afterwards, I left and went home. I was watching television with my husband. He, as usual, had total control of the remote control. and. You know, was flipping through all the channels. I don't know why men do that. I, we, we should have um, a thesis on that. But then our daughter rushed in and she said, watch CNN, just, just watch CNN. And so we did. At that time, we didn't have um, other international or Western news channels such as BBC or Al Jazeera English. We only had CNN um, and also a news channel from Singapore and of course our local news channels. So what we saw was what the whole world saw. That unbelievable footage of one of the towers of the World Trade Center in New York with plumes of black smoke drifting upwards from its middle floors. And next, we saw the second plane flying straight into the second tower. I remember all of us in our darkened bedroom, watching the footage, hearing the voices of the commentators who were shocked, horrified, and we too were shocked and horrified, and we couldn't believe what we had seen. And we stayed watching news channels for I think about the next two hours, and we, we didn't sleep until early morning. Then, for almost the whole of the next day and night, all the television sets in all my family's rooms at the hotel were switched on to one or other news channels, both local and international. I remember very vividly, until today, of watching television with my mother as an American woman described on CNN how her son had phoned her from one of the two planes, and he had said, Mom, I just want you to know I love you. During those weeks of seeing a mother mourn for her son 
thousands of miles away from us, I know for a fact that my mother did not think, oh well, she's not a Muslim like us, so what does it matter? And neither did I. At that moment, we were just two mothers who watched with horror the pain and the anguish of another mother. Then when I went to the hotel again the next day, because we had promised the children that we'd take them to Singapore and to go to the zoo and other places, I saw many police cars and policemen with sniffer dogs at the lobby. When I asked why the police were there, I was told that the hotel had received an anonymous phone call saying that there was a bomb in the building. So I phoned my older children. I told them to please wake up all their younger cousins, regardless whether they were still asleep and in pajamas, and to take them to our house and to leave the hotel immediately. I told my sister and brothers the same thing. We waited at um, my home for many anxious hours. And then we were told that there was no bombs in the hotel and that it had just been a, a hoax. It had been a prank call. It was someone's idea of a joke, although not a very funny one. I imagine that there was a group of people who thought that those two buildings in New York City had collapsed into dust and thousands of people had died Let's see if we can scare some people here. And they did. The reason I share this particular experience with you is because I'd like you all to know that this did not pl take place in a city in the West. This happened in a city in a Muslim country in the East. In other words, the repercussions of 9-11 were not confined to non-Muslim countries of the West. We as Muslims in a country where Islam is the official religion also felt the same anguish, bewilderment, and were subjected to the same fears. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say we need to build bridges between Islam and the West, this is a sort of experience which Muslims have gone through and is a kind of information that should be shared between us all. Whether we are Muslims or not, whether we have Caucasian blood coursing through our bodies or we don't, we share a lot in common. We all have families and friends whom we love. When we see men and women grieving for their loved ones, we react not with indifference because they are not Muslims, but with sympathy and understanding because we can imagine what they felt. Most of us are parents too. Some of us have spouses, we have brothers and sisters, we have cousins, nieces and nephews, and we have friends we care about deeply. When the writer, again I refer to Akbar Ahmed, met with Muslims from around the world, spe specifically to find out how they felt about their faith and their opinions about the West, he said he tried to make them understand that not everyone in the West in particular those who were Christians or Jews, should be banded together. He at that time lived in America and worked in America. He writes, I noted that a bishop and a rabbi, as well as others, had quite consciously reached out to me in Washington in the dark days after 9-11 and made me feel welcome and mentioned especially the Christian Christmas card sent by one, Bishop John Chain of the National Cathedral, which moved me greatly with his Abrahamic message of compassion, understanding, and above all, unity. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to reveal the law to Moses, he said, and to reveal the sacred Quran to the prophet Muhammad. The bishop's words displayed extraordinary courage, imagination, and compassion. But in the same way that we sympathize with the families of those who were killed on 9-11, during 9-11, we also wish to see an end to the suffering 
of the people in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Palestine. Just as the families of the victims of 9-11 mourn for their loved ones, we must acknowledge that the Afghans, the Iraqis, and the Palestinians too have grieved for members of the families who had been killed by bombs and bullets. In addition, most of them have had their homes destroyed. The West has to understand that Muslims view the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Afghans, Iraqis, and Palestinians with sorrow and, yes, with anger too. Why was a war waged on Iraq when 15 out of the 18 9-11 suicide bombers were Saudis and the militant camp they trained in called Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan? It didn't make sense. Now I'd like to explain or say a little bit of who we, the Muslims, are. One of the misconceptions by Islam is that it is a religion that is made up of a majority of Arabs. In actual fact, the majority of the world's Muslims live in Asia and Africa, not the Arab world. The largest Muslim communities are in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and Nigeria rather than Saudi Arabia, Egypt, or Iran. And millions of Muslims live in Europe, the United States, and Canada, where they represent the second and third largest religion. The world's 1.3 billion Muslims live in some 57 countries around the world that are majority Muslims or have significant Muslim minorities. Arabs make up only roughly 20% of the global Muslim population. For far too long, those of us who consider ourselves as moderate Muslims have remained silent, while the radicals and the extremists among us have chosen to voice and act out their anger and grievances with the West, and they have done so in the name of Islam. Now it is the moderate Muslims, such as us, who must speak up before the misconceptions and misunderstandings which exist between Islam and the West escalate further. We do, however, have to understand that it's difficult for non-Muslim people in the West to think of Islam as a religion of peace when much of what they hear and know is about bombings in cities the world over the Bali bombings, the London bombings, the bombs targeted in Mumbai, the constant unrest in Pakistan, with the latest suicide bombings of a Sufi shrine in Lahore just a few weeks ago. So most Muslims are seen as no different from the terrorists who have caught the attention and the interest of the world's media. And most of us use those words, terrorists, terrorism, without really knowing their origins or their meanings. In actual fact, the word terrorism is derived from the word, Latin word terere, which means to make someone tra tremble. The West must also realize that 9-11 was not the only terrorist act that had happened in America. It gained world attention, but prior to and after 9-11, there had and has been other terrorist attacks, and they were not perpetrated by Muslims. The, work, the vast majority of terrorist attacks on US soil have been perpetrated by Christian terrorist groups in the past 15 years. Catholics, Lutheran, and Presbyterian activists have bombed gay bars, shot or killed abortion staff, and bombed their clinics. White Christian supremacy inspired the attacks on the Centennial Olympic Park in Atlanta and many other incidents. Timothy McVeigh used Christian cosmotheism espoused by William Pierce to justify bombing the federal building in Oklahoma City. However different, religions have become a means to legitimize holy and unholy 
struggles and wars. For those in the West who depend upon te television and news items to know or read about Muslims, the present day perception of Muslims as depicted by the media is often of robed men and women in sparse and arid lands dotted with very few villages. These images depict a people who are poor and by inference, uneducated. The other image of Muslims are of machine-wielding men, eyes filled with much anger and desperation. Then there are the women, heads bowed, distrustfully looking into journalist cameras, their clothes drab and shabby. So for most people in the West, Muslims in the East are seen as backward, poor people. And because of these media images, many people in the West have either forgotten or are not aware that an Islamic civilization had existed and flourished from the 7th to the 17th centuries. It was known for its arts, sciences, medicines, and its many inventions. Let us look at just one of its many inventions, the professor's chair. You must have wondered why a chairman or woman, professional head of an organization, is called by such a title. In today's terminology, they are often just referred to as the chair. This usually means a professor who has been awarded the chair of, say, mathemati mathematics, or it is a president who presides at the meetings of an organization, and people have to address their remarks to this chairperson. If we go back to the teachings in the mosques, Muslim schools and university over a thousand years ago, we'll find a study group or study circle or halakat al-ilm or halaka gathered around a professor who was seated on a chair or kursi in Arabic. It is this notion of chair or kursi that evolved into a professional position like the chair of a board or a committee. At a meeting of Hewlett Packard's worldwide managers on the 26th of September 2001, 15 days after 9-11, Ms. Carlton Fiorina, the CEO of Hewlett Packard Corporation said, there was once a civilization that was the greatest in the world. It was able to create a continental super state that stretched from ocean to ocean and from northern climes to tropics and des deserts. Within its dominion lived hundreds of millions of people of different creeds and ethnic origins. One of its languages became the universal language of much of the world, the bridge between the peoples of a hundred lands. Its armies were made up of people of many nationalities, and its military protection allowed a degree of peace and prosperity that had never been known. The reach of the civilization's commerce extended from Latin America to China and everywhere in between. And this civilization was driven more than anything by invention. Its architects designed buildings that defied gravity. Its mathematicians created the algebra and algorithms that would enable the building of computers and the creation of encryption. Its doctors examined the human body and found new cures for disease. Its astronomers looked into the heavens, named the stars, and paved the way for space travel and exploration. Its writers created thousands of stories. Its poets wrote of love. While modern Western civilizations share many of these traits, the civilization I'm talking about was the Islamic world from the year 800 to 1600, which included the Ottoman Empire and the courts of Baghdad, Damascus, and Cairo. Although we are often unaware of our indebtedness to this other civilization, its gifts are very much a part of our heritage. The technology industry would not exist without the contribution of Arab mathematicians. Now I'd like to go on and speak about building bridges between
between Muslims and Christians. While we Muslims often bemoan the fact that the West do not understand us, we are ourselves not without fault. In conversations with fellow Malaysian Muslims, I noted that when we talk about Christians, it is to see them, Christians, as just one group of people, without acknowledging that they too are divided into different denominations, similar to Muslims being either Sunnis or Shia. Thus, there is a need to have a mutual understanding and knowledge of each other. If we expect the West and Western Christians to understand us, we must also make an effort to learn about them and to understand them. The concept of mutual respect and understanding is important if we are to read the stereotypical image of Muslims as extremists and terrorists. Muslims must acknowledge the fact that we share a history together with Jews and Christians. Again, I refer to what Akbar Ahmed wrote on his travels in the Muslim countries. The Syrian minister of expatriates, Botana Shaban, and many other Muslims throughout our travels expressed sentiments of communal spirituality. Shaban told us that from 627 to 647 CE, Muslims and Christians were praying together in the Umayyad Mosque until they decided to build a church. We shouldn't think of East and West. You can't be a Muslim until you believe in Abraham and Christ. The oldest synagogue in the world is in Damascus. The oldest church in the world is also in Damascus. As regards the Grand Mosque in Damascus, Akbar Ahmad wrote, the mosque holds a shrine dedicated to the head of John the Baptist, who is revered in Islam as Yahya, prophet. Another shrine to Hussein, the grandson of the prophet of Islam, and the son of Ali, who is especially venerated by the Shia. And just outside the mosque's walls, a simple and small grave for Saladin, one of the greatest rulers of Islam. On my visit, I saw all manner of pilgrims at each of these historical sites. Christians and Muslims praying at John's shrine. Shia women dressed in black who were from Iran and still mourning the death of Hussein. And scholars and tourists paying quiet tribute to the great Saladin. Ladies and gentlemen, so far I have referred to Muslims in general from all around the world. Now I would like to talk about Muslims in Malaysia. I'm actually particularly concerned about our young Malaysian Muslims and how they seem to be uncomfortable with fellow Malaysians who are not Muslims. This was not the case many years ago. The way that younger Malaysian Muslims think and act are really the responses to what globalization has brought to our country. Islam was once a great civilization, and it can be great again. One of the ways to achieve this greatness is to build bridges of understanding and tolerance with the people of the West, and beginning also with the people of other religions in our own country. Thank you. Wa bilahi taafiq wal hidayah. Assalamu alaikum.